Many of you are aware we had a little excitement during the first service this morning. The choir is required to come back because they paid no attention to my sermon at all. I was so I felt so insulted. I thought it was a pretty good one. <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, one of our choir members, uh, Wilson Higgs, uh, passed out during and fell over. Uh, during the gospel reading, I wasn't aware of it until until I turned from the gospel and the choir is all going. <laughs> uh, he is fine. They, they did call uh, 911, but uh, he's he was alert and knew the date and time and everything else and could just was in his, his right mind. And Charlotte came and picked him up and took him home. So he didn't go to the hospital or anything like that. No. That's my that's my understanding. Isn't that true? He did not go to the hospital. Well, they were going to take him to the hospital. Charlotte was going to meet him at the ER. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we have conflicting stories here about what happened. In any case, he's all right, and apparently he's uh, his meds have been doing this to him in the mornings. He's we pray for him. But he's doing well. So please, you can set your hearts at, at rest. Inquired, you can hear the service second time for second time. Let's begin in prayer. Lord, thank you that you know the grief of our hearts and the sense of abandonment that we feel sometimes. Whether it's been our fault or not, you know you know where we are. Thank you for your good news and your love that surrounds us and holds us and claims us in our sense of abandonment. Thank you for Isaiah and for the word that he brings us. Open your word to us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Before we move into new stuff, um, let me give you a chance to come back a little bit to the servant songs that we were looking at last time. What I was lay, laying out for you at the end of the hour last time is a claim that, at least as I read the servant songs, um, they really have multiple meanings. The very center of it is, is Jesus Christ, that he is the one, he is the one who lives them out completely and fully, uh, that he is the, the servant of the Lord who pours himself out for, for a guilty world um, and, and heals us by, his, by the wounds that he bears. Um, but along the way, that those songs also claim that the servant is Israel. Well, one way to think of that is to think that Jesus is, in fact, Israel. Jesus is what Israel was intended to be. He's the true Israel. But that doesn't discount the other Israel, the Israel that God had nurtured all along. And so what I was suggesting is that um, on, on one level, this uh, description of the servant of the Lord is the call of God's people Israel from the very beginning, from when God first called Abraham and Sarah. That, um, that, that really has been their job description. They've not lived it out very well, as we have not lived it out very well. Um, but that has, in fact, been their call. Then perhaps as that um, arrow, if you remember that elongated X design that we had, as that shrinks toward the center, uh, perhaps it also refers to a faithful remnant within Israel. That, because there are places where here is, one, here is this servant who is Israel, but also has a mission to Israel, and is called to, um, to live, a, live a faithfully on behalf of the rest. Um, so perhaps in some way it refers to, it talks about a faithful remnant within Israel, perhaps even key individuals. Then above all, it's Jesus Christ. And then the X goes out the other direction um, till it fans out and becomes the, the body of Christ, uh, living out his servanthood in the world. Now there's nobody who's else besides Jesus who's going to die on behalf of the whole world. world okay? Jesus' death on the cross for us and for the whole world is complete. But there are some mysterious kinds of ways that I don't really understand in which, um, in which the body of Christ or the people of Christ continue to carry Jesus' work of bearing the world, of, car of carrying the world, um, and of suffering on behalf of the world. Uh, later on, as we move into the last section of Isaiah, we'll see an example of that in, in Isaiah, where Isaiah calls on his 
the faithful people in his community to be confessing the sin of the whole body, whether they did it themselves or not, to be confessing on behalf of the whole and pleading for redemption on behalf of the whole. Now, there's a, one little piece of that. That's what I was trying to get at at the very end of our time last week. So let me open the floor and ask if, are there things, I know you've thought about nothing else all week except this. Are there things that you were wanting to get at before we move ahead to move into stuff? As Diane Jacobson said the other night, on Friday night, then I guess I was crystal clear last night. <laughs> okay. Today, I've actually mislabeled the top of this. I say Isaiah 40 to 49 to 51 and 54. We're not doing 40 to 51. It's Isaiah 49 and 50 and 54. We'll pick up 51 uh, next week. Um, as we move into this part of these um, exile chapters, all of a sudden we get a whole, a whole series of uh, feminine pictures. Not so much of God now, you, get a little, you make the tiny tastes of that, but, um, but pictures of Jerusalem as a bereaved woman. Jerusalem or Zion. Now if you think of this, now Jerusalem is this ruined city lying hundreds of miles off to the west from where these exiles are. Uh, so, so she is this pile of ruins with some poor folks living among it trying to eke out a living. Um, so, but whenever um, Isaiah now talks about a bereaved, um, bereft Zion or Jerusalem, he's really talking to these exiles who are here hundreds of miles away. Um, the children of that broken city. So it goes both ways, whether he talks directly to the exiles or whether he talks about, talks to broken Zion, it's the same thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I put a couple of bullets there shortly down the page. First one is the pastoral flavor of these chapters. Um, all the way through these chapters, we're seeing... Um, the kind of pastor heart of this prophet and how God makes this prophet aware of what the people are feeling and crying and grieving. Um, and so he's able to speak to those things. That really comes out in these chapters. So you, you really get a sense that God knows what the people are feeling and speaks it through this prophet. That's one of the things I love about these chapters. And then right below that, a warning. These chapters are going to tap into some of our own life experiences and our own griefs. They will talk about childlessness or loss of children. They will talk about being abandoned or divorced or bereft. And so I, I know all too well that as we head into these marvelous pictures that Isaiah gives us, it's going to touch all kinds of nerves in the room. Um, it's okay. Um, this isn't going to be, we're not going to turn this into a therapy session or anything like that, but I am aware that this is one of those places where God's word is likely to touch our pain. Uh, just be aware that that's the case. And then let God speak to that pain. Okay? Um, I'll try not to push it too much, but I want you to, to see it and hear it and feel it. Okay, and then one last piece has to do, before we get into it, has to do with male and female and with, uh, with a patriarchal society as Israel was. God created us male and female in God's image, um, equally in God's image and in God's dignity. Um, that was God's intent from the beginning. A pat patriarchal society <laughs> shifted that, shifted the balance of power to the male. And that is the lens that Israel experiences their life through, and most of Western history has likewise. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways that will play out here is that if, um, if God and Israel are going to be depicted as a married couple, which one is God? The <laughs> husband. And Israel is the wife, or Jerusalem is the wife. Uh, it never turns those around. And that's part of speaking to, a, in a, to an in a patriarchal society. It also means that uh, 
since God is the, is the husband, God's never going to be the um, unfaithful spouse, right? So if, if one spouse is going to be unfaithful, it's the bride. Women get, get, an unfair de get some unfair dealing in this one. There's a place actually in the book of James in the New Testament where um, God calls us adulterous people as a whole, that we are an adulterous people that have turned our, ourselves against God and gone after other values. But what the text actually says is God calls us adulteresses. It's, it's feminine. You could be really insulted by that if you want to be. Just be aware that that's part of speaking into a male-dominated culture. Um, so having said that, I want to set that aside. Okay, we've acknowledged it. Now let's see what what God and Isaiah do with these <coughs> with these female pictures. Isaiah chapter forty-nine. Beginning in verse 13. Would someone read for us, please? 13 through 18. <coughs> Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his affliction. <coughs> Did you say 18? Mm -hmm. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should have no compassion on the son in her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have graven you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders outstrip your destroyers, and those who laid you waste go forth from you. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather, they come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Thank you. What do you notice? What do you hear? What stands out? Zion said, who's Zion? Okay, Zion is, um, in, in these chapters, Zion is Jerusalem. Okay. Zion technically is the name of the hill on which the temple was built. Um, so in, narrowly speaking, Zion is the temple hill within Jerusalem. But with the way it functions in this poetry, it's, it's often in parallel, Zion, Jerusalem, Zion, Jerusalem. Yeah. Well, notice, by the way, that with that, but Zion said, here's an example of where God knows and the prophet knows what the people are feeling. So even though Zion is talking about that ruined city hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles away, he's really talking about what we exiles here are feeling. What we're feeling is God has forsaken us. God has forgotten us. We've been here for decades and God has not shown up. And so God pastorally now speaks to that, the heart of that. Well, it's pastoral, but it's also, it's really a strong statement. When, you know, can, I, I won't forget you, like a woman forgetting her suckling child will forget that before I forget you. Yes. And that's a pretty strong measure. Yeah. Why do you think you fix that image, the image of a woman with her suckling child? Why pick that one for a comparison? Giving nourishment to the child, same to God, giving nourishment to the The woman gives nourishment to the child, God gives nourishment to the, to the people. It's yep. hard to forget that you have a baby that's nursing. It's hard to forget that you have a baby that's nursing, especially while you're nursing. During that time, there are reminders that happen. And you're bonding with that child every time you're caring for it. So you're bonding with a tighter relationship. Absolutely. This is, it's difficult to imagine a human relationship that is more, uh, more bonded than this one. Is it possible for a woman to forget her suckling child? There have been news stories. There have been news stories of women who abandon their children or who... It, 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 it can... It's, I think what he's trying to say is, that's unimaginable, although I suppose in extreme circumstances it could actually happen. Um, but we can't think of a human relationship that would be more uh, unbreakable. Uh, unforgettable than this one. 
So then, to, then for God to step on and say, even these may forget. It's possible that a woman could forget her suckling child, yet I will not forget you. So to pick the most bonded relationship that you can imagine, and then for God to say, I'll go at one better. I cannot forget my child. That's powerful stuff. How, so how do you hear that? What does that do to you when you hear it? Feel pretty good. Makes you feel pretty good. It says, Behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. So you're as close as he can possibly be. Yeah. Yeah, so we now he has another image. An image of the, the city of Jerusalem tattooed, graven into the skin of God's <coughs> own hand. So that every time God's, God puts his hand out to do something, oh, there is Jerusalem graven on the palm of my hand. I can't forget you. With everything I do, I'm thinking about you. What does that do to you to hear God saying, with everything I do, with every time I move my hand, I think of you? Secure, safe. Secure, safe. Yeah, this is powerful stuff. And it's, and it's powerful stuff spoken to people who feel like God's forgotten them. Yeah. It kind of almost implies that everything, you can't, I mean, you can, but it's hard to work without your hands. And so because that image is on his hands, yep. all of his works are based off that. Yeah, and it's not on the back of God's hand where God, where you kind of miss it, right here. Where every time you put your hand to something, there's Jerusalem. That's what makes us human. We're the only ones who can do this. That's right. Like that far side cartoon of the cow standing outside, watching, listening to the phone ring, and thinking, oh, I wish I had opposable thumbs. <laughs> 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 Now there will be, uh, you will um, hear some Christian preachers and Bible, st Bible students and things like that take this one step further. Um, if you think about print, imprinting in, some, in somebody's palms, what do you think of as a Christian? The nails. The nail. Yeah, even if technically the nail holes were probably down here in the wrists instead, but... Um, we have that image of the nail holes in Jesus' palms. Now, this is, that's not what this is saying, because what, we're, what the tattoo or the, the, the engraving is, is the design of Jerusalem itself, <clears throat> a picture of Jerusalem itself. But it's not a very far step for God to have engraven Jerusalem on his own palm with that kind of commitment, and then to step further and do, do an even deeper commitment. Uh, by going to the death for us. It's kind of a wonderful connection, actually. So how come it took him a hundred years looking at this thing before he finally decided to do something? <laughs> how come it took him a hundred years? It was only about 48. Yeah, 48. Yeah. <laughs> how come it took him 48 years looking at this before he did something? And that's exactly <coughs> part of the problems this wrestles with. How would you respond to that at this point? If God really feels that way, why wait 48 years? They had to wait till they were ready. Had to wait till they were ready. Are they ready? They have to think or ponder why they're there. Needed time to ponder why, why, why they're there. And some of us are slow learners. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the issues that this that the exile wrestles with. Why did why did we wind up here? Why did God let us go? What was this all about? Did we deserve it? Was, were we all that bad? <coughs> at the beginning of these chapters, God says, actually, you got dealt twice as bad as you, really, as you were. You didn't deserve this much. What's, what's the mystery of all this? And then why should God wait so long? Um, that's part of what these chapters wrestle with. Hang on to that. We'll see if we get any more help as we go along. Okay. So if nothing else, please notice both the desperation that the people are feeling, the, the sense of abandonment, and now God's amazing 
word of commitment to them. Yeah. And it ends with, in 18, all these people coming. As we read on, we'll discover these are children coming, all these children. Have you ever seen one of those, um, I can't remember which group it is, I think it's a Southwest Native American tribe that has this image of this uh, huge grandmother or something sitting or lying down and all of these tiny children climbing all over her. Have you seen those? Um, I, think it's, I think it's Southwest Indian. Um, that's what I see whenever I read these verses here is bereft Zion and suddenly she's got a pile of children climbing all over her. Um, that's verse 18. Lift up your eyes all around and see they're all gathering, they're coming. As I live, says the Lord, you shall put them all on like an ornament. You're going to wear all these kids like an ornament. And like a bride, you shall bind them. <coughs> okay. Can someone read the next please, piece, please? That's 19 to 23. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land. Surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants, and those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children born in the time of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, The place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, Who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away, but who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. Whence then have these come? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their bosom, <clears throat> and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. <coughs> With their faces to the ground they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who, put, those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Thank you. What are you hearing? What do you notice? God's going to take care of you. Okay. You will grow and thrive. Because you will grow and thrive. Your place will be small. Are you catching the basic picture in, the, in those opening verses of uh, all these kids coming? And now we're going to need a bigger tent. We've got to build a bigger house. Where did all these kids come from? My goodness. We've got to make room for them. And it's such a... a um, one, of the, one of the lines that really caught me is in 20, the children born in the time of your bereavement. In the time of your widowhood, in the time of your being without, the children, thank you, the children born when there could be no children born. How do you have all these, no wonder she's acting surprised. Where did all these kids come from when, when there couldn't be any more kids? They're all gone and the possibility of having kids is gone. Where did these come from? So here is destroyed Jerusalem. Just looking in amazement. Thank you. A dry one. <laughs> uh, here's bereaved, here's destroyed Jerusalem looking in amazement at all of these children she has and she can't figure out where they came from. But God's brought them all home. Um, this is a promise of real restoration and shock of restoration, actually. And I love the, ki the kids saying, hey, this place is too crowded for me. Make room for me to settle. Can you build an extra bedroom somewhere? We need some room here. Too many kids. It's a lovely picture. And then moving into 22 and 23, God saying, the prophet saying that all of the, that the kings, the kings and queens of uh, all around are going to be bringing all your kids home. They're going to be serving you and bringing your children back home again. Is this one person talking, or is it the group of people? Is this one person that he's talking to or a group of people? And the answer is yes. This is one of those places where um, we have a corporate, corporate figure. And so the one he's talking to is Zion, Jerusalem, Mother Zion. And so he's talking to her as our mother, this ruined city. 
but she's an image of all of God's people, of all of Israel. So it's 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 really both at the same time. All these people didn't come out of one person. No, they didn't all come out of one person unless you go way way back to Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the ending verses of this chapter sound a little more grim. Can prey be taken from the mighty or captives of a tyrant be rescued? I'll contend with those who contend with you. God's saying, I'll, I'll, if, you, if other people beat up on you, I'm going to beat up on them, is basically what it's saying. So here again is the captive, the captive exiles wondering, well, how in the world are you going to make this happen? We are captive here. And God's saying, Babylon's power is no power. And whoever stands in the way of my bringing you home, I will deal with them. I'm in charge here, and I'm going to do this for you. So what sounds like uh, grim stuff is actually saving news for, for, for the Jews. Chapter 50. Would somebody read for us, please, just verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins, you were sold. Because of your transgressions, your mother was sent away. Thank you. <clears throat> what are you hearing? What's the basic image that we're dealing with here? Separation. Separation. What kind? Mm -hmm. Separation from God, depict, depicted how? Divorce. 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 Okay, and the divorce, of course, being the woman's fault, right? Divorce. Yep. Um, a picture of divorce. What about the kids? What's their role in this? Sold as slaves. Sold as slaves. Yeah, so really two pictures of... Um, disrupted, destroyed family, divorce of the couple, and, and so the, the, the woman cast off, and then the children sold into slavery or sold for some debt or something or other. Um, and once again, you can hear the, the pastor's heart of God and of the prophet hearing what the people are feeling, that God cast us off, God sold us, God got rid of us. Is it true? <clears throat> Did God divorce his bride? No. How many say no? How many say yes? I think he just took a separation. Took a separation. <laughs> Went and got an apartment someplace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if there's been a divorce a, 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 between the two. God and, and in Israel there would have been this bill or document that, that there's no document which means just just the yeah. <clears throat> so that does seem to be the implication at first that the people are feeling like God divorced us God cast us off God got rid of us and so he challenges them saying show me the document show me the document there's the certificate of divorce that says I divorced you and the implication of that seems to be, there ain't one, you're not going to find it. Um, I did not divorce you. But then, the last line of the verse, for your transgressions your mother was put away. Did God divorce her or not? He's on sabbatical. <laughs> We're getting into the heart of the of the problem of what what's been going on these forty eight years, right? Or the kids, Dad, you sold us away as slaves, and and so Dad says, Well, to whom have I sold you? If you think I sold you, who did I sell you to? And the implication seems to be, I didn't sell you. Next line. Because of your sins, you were sold. So did God tear apart this family or not? I tore it apart to put it back together. Tore it apart to put it back together. Because that's, that's the whole verse. It was full of tough language. Yeah. I mean, nothing nice in it. No. 
Yeah. It's, this is a hard one. Because I really want, and I assume you do too, I really want to say, no, God did not divorce her. God would not cast, God's not, God is faithful always and steadfast. God would never cast us off. God would never sell us. The last part of the verse says, yeah, I did. It, it's like it was your fault, but I did. Maybe it's like discipline, you know. He did it's a discipline. This, <laughs> it's not a punishment, it's a learning. Yeah. Okay. Is, is this is this a really hard discipline? Is it a learning process? Oh, okay. Tough love. Tough love. Uh, and that's where um, I think the tough love image is a helpful one. Where because of <laughs> Because of addiction or a process where the where the addicted one is is destroying the family, and find those times when the family has to decide, we love you with all our hearts, but you can't live here. Um, those are awful, awful hard moments, and sometimes it's the only way, the only possibility of break that, that we can see of breaking the pattern, and even then it doesn't always work. Is the exile God's tough love in, term, in a time of addiction? That we were so addicted to our power and our and our kingdom and everything else that we were building that this was the only way. But but the concept of tough love presumes that the love is always there, right? Even if it doesn't look like it at the moment. This is a hard one. What I love about it is that it really gets to the heart of what the people are experiencing. It doesn't, it really acknowledging, acknowledges what the people have been going through. God's been gone, as far as they can tell, for 48 years. Yeah, I mean, was there any, was there any prophets or anybody in amongst them trying to, trying to speak to him from God, or was it pretty much... Yeah, and we don't really know. There were, we do have some passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel that speak to the early time of the exile, and Ezekiel was there. Ezekiel got carried off into the, in the first deportation. So for at least for a while, Ezekiel was there bringing the word. How long? I don't know. We don't know of other prophets, for sure. We have the stories of Daniel, um, so there were faithful individuals along the way who were holding fast to God. So there were people who were keeping alive, keeping the faith alive. What form that took and what, what sense they had of God's presence, <coughs> we don't know much. Okay. 50, uh, verse 2. God continues to speak, Why was no one there when I came? Why did no one answer when I called? We don't know when, we're, when God's talking about here. Is he talking about long ago before Jerusalem was even lost? I kept coming to you and there was nobody home. Why was that? Or has this been during the exile? Has God been coming to them and saying in one way or another and pleading with them and nobody hears? Or is it right now? Is it As, I, as I'm bringing you this news that we're going home, why is, why is nobody listening? Um, it's hard to know exactly what time God's talking about, but you can hear the grief in God's own heart. Yeah, I've been pleading and pleading and pleading with my people, and nobody hears me. It's kind of two sides to this one. Yeah. And the issue then is, do you think I can't do this? Is my hand too short? Won't it stretch out far enough for me to rescue you? No, look at the things that I can do. I can make fish die. <coughs> and clothe the heavens with blackness. All kinds of... I can, I'm the creator. I can do what I want. I have the power to bring you home. This is just filled with grief, isn't it? Will you skip over, please, to chapter 54? Can someone read for us, please, first three verses? Same old 
barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy. You who ne were never in labor, because more than more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has had a who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will <coughs> spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cries or cities. Do not be afraid, you will not suffer shame. Do not fear grace, disgrace, you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. Thank you. Um, of those first three verses, what's the basic female image we have here now? A childless woman. A childless woman. Um, childlessness is a real struggle now for, for, for folks too. Some of you have gone through that and know the pain and the agony of that when you are wishing for children and they just don't come. Um, in Israel, it's that plus more. Because in this patriarchal society, where a woman's worth is usually valued by the children, especially the sons that she can provide for her husband. Her standing in the community depends on her, her, her marital and uh, child connections. And to be childless is just is an utter curse. That's why you get these, these stories over and over again of the matriarch who can't have a child and then finally God steps in and there's a miraculous happening. This is, so this is anguish plus total loss of any kind of place to be or status. It's, um, it's compounded. It, it's, it's, it's hard stuff. Uh, what's the message of these first three verses? You're going to have many descendants? Or? Tons and tons of kids. Yep. And now you get more about that. Uh, we need a bigger house. This is a tent now in verse 2. Enlarge your tent. Let the curtains be stretched out. Don't hold back. Lengthen the cords. Strengthen your stakes. Got to have a much bigger Bedouin tent here than we had before because there are going to be tons and tons of kids. You will spread out to the right and the left and your descendants will possess the nations. Uh, this is total reversal of Israel's desolation. There's, a, um, there's a, a passage that we skipped over that we'll see next week in chapter 51 where... where uh, the prophet says, remember the rock that you were cut out from, the quarry that you were dug from. Remember Abraham, remember Sarah who bore you. Um, Abraham and Sarah, God started out with just Abraham and Sarah. And all whole story of Abraham and Sarah is, is there ever going to be a child? How are we going to have all these descendants if there's never a child? And God says, keep waiting, keep waiting. And then finally God provides. And now, descendants as the stars of the heaven or as the sand on the seashore. Um, he's saying, I'm going to do that again. You feel as bereft as Abraham and Sarah did. And now there is going to be bounty of life coming from you. Total restoration. With verse 4, do not fear, you will not be ashamed, do not be discouraged, you won't be suffered disgrace. You will forget the shame of your youth and the disgrace of your widowhood you will remember no more. Speaking now to her bereft condition. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, like the wife of a man's youth when she is cast off says your God. So drawing the image again of, of a young marriage, but the, but the bride gets cast off and, and abandoned. It says, the Lord is your husband. Your maker is your husband. Isn't that an interesting line? Any of you have that as one of your favorite passages? Yeah. <laughs> your maker is your husband. But now look at verse 7. For a brief moment, I... Did what? Forsook. Mine says abandoned. I forsook you. But with great compassion I will gather you. 
In overflowing wrath, for a moment, I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Just like the days of Noah to me, as just as I swore that the waters of Noah would never again go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and I will not rebuke you. For, I remember the earlier where he was saying, Can I, is it possible for a, for a woman to forget her suckling child? Yes. Well, I suppose it could happen, but not with God. Now we have the same image, same kind of uh, flavor, but the image is mountains. Is it possible these mountains could ever disappear? That's verse 10. For the mountains may depart, and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. My covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. What are you hearing? Kind of a double standard. Double standard, how so? <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Say more. Well, in a way, he says, for a brief moment, I forsook you. Um, but with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing wrath, for a moment, I hid my face from you. Yeah. Um, but he's not quite allowing that from the woman. She doesn't get to do the same thing. No. Yeah. There is a little power differential going on here right, and there. Right. Yeah. So what's the difference between abandonment and uh, forgetting? What's the difference between abandonment and forgetting? Yeah. It says, I, 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 I abandoned you, I forsook you. Does that mean he was still thinking about it, but not just abandoned his What do you think? Did he abandon her, uh, abandoned her but didn't forget her? Was still thinking about her? I think abandonment is kind of an intentional thing, and forgetting isn't necessarily. Forgetting is accidental, Abandon, abandoning is on purpose. So do you like these verses or not? The end result is overwhelming steadfast love and holding you for a lifetime or for forever. What do you think about that? I mentally go back to well, that chapter, that verse that says, Can a woman forget her son child? To me, being a mother was the first I really knew of unconditional love. Mm. And long after me. Bingo. This is the one that, uh, that gets quoted in the New Testament, for out of Egypt have I called my son. Um, but it's really not talking about Jesus and Hosea, because if it's talking about Jesus, then Jesus is a wayward brat. Um, God says in Hosea, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So that's the, the birth of God taking Israel, the people, out of their slavery. And then the verses go on to how God's done everything for this child, and the child keeps running away. And as you keep reading the chapter, it goes back and forth. So just this, and I keep thinking, whenever I read it, I think of Tevya on the Fiddler on the Roof. Of, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand. And back and forth and back and forth whenever he's in his little bubble there. Uh, 
Uh, here's God wrestling. It's a, it's a very human God that we see there wrestling with what to do with my wayward child. I am so mad. I want to cream him. But I love it. How can I do that to Jacob? How can I abandon my child? Um, and it just, you just watch it going back and forth. And then God's, God's saying, God having to bring tough love down upon the child, but at the same time saying, I cannot give up on this child. I cannot turn my back on them. Um, this is sort of off your point, but it was interesting way back when our youngest son, Lars, was in confirmation. I had taught confirmation for many years at Prince of Peace in Burnsville. And um, we always had 10 kids per class. And it was such a huge church that there were many, 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 many classes. So we probably put three or five classes together, and they wanted we were having each of them act out um, the, um, um, the time of exile. And the kids, of course, thought it was so boring because it was you know, 40 years in the wilderness. And um, so they begged. Uh, our son was chosen to be Moses by the other kids. And so he begged to have commer commercials. You know, to kind of spice it up a little bit. And, <laughs> so I said, okay. And, um, you know, Ro had started this restaurant chain called Old Country Buffet, uh, Hometown Buffet Restaurants. Well, so they went along and they just thought, oh, what a boring life. I mean, you're in sand. And, you know, they just kept wandering, 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 and trying to push the years back. And so finally then Lars got up on, the, on a rock, pretend rock, and he said, hey Israelites, are you sick and tired of manna? Well, if you are, go to your nearest old country buffet. <laughs> and so their rationale was that if they could have spent their money doing something like that, then they wouldn't have had money to burn to make the fat, you know, the calf, and that they would have changed history. And they were trying every which way to change history so that they wouldn't have gone as astray, because they felt that God had left them on their own, and that he had really caused their bad behavior. So, <laughs> that makes it come alive. <laughs> the problem that we're wrestling with, in, with here is not just an Old Testament problem. Do you remember what Jesus cries from the cross? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Did God forsake him? You'll get different answers from different people as they read that, huh? Um, did God forsake Jesus because Jesus was carrying the sin of the world? And by definition, that had to be the case. Did God forsake Jesus because that's what Jesus needed to do for our sake, to bear this darkness that the world bears? Um, but did God for God is in that with Jesus entirely at the same time. Um, this is not just an Old Testament problem, this is a new one. And, to take it further, how many of you have ever felt abandoned by God? Only two of you, not the three of you, okay. Have, have you ever had times in your life where you feel like God has turned your back, his back? Or that God has ignored you? Or it's, a, it's an experience, it's, a, it's something that's common to the life of believers throughout the centuries. So at least on the human level, <clears throat> on the level, on a pastoral level, on the level of human experience, if nothing else, Isaiah is telling the people, God knows what you've been experiencing, and God is taking it seriously. That when God says, for a brief moment I abandoned you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing wrath, for a moment I hid my face from you. Uh, there is truth in that. 
That's, that, at the very least, is exactly what Israel experienced. And he's saying, you are right, that's what you experienced from me. Now, you don't know where God's heart was in the midst of all that silence. You don't know what God's intent and God's long-term plans were. And you didn't know why this was happening. Um, but that is, in fact, what you experienced. And what I want you to know now is that time is over. And it's time for absolute steadfast love and restoration that will so dwarf that time that it will seem completely insignificant. But it's unsettling. It still sits there. Um, from the human side, from the, the human experience, God did abandon them. And God admits it. God says so. From the standpoint of God's own eternal heart, you might come up with a different answer. But if nothing else, God's not saying to the people, oh no, you just felt like that. You were wrong. He's saying you were right. And then, steadfast love. Great compassion and everlasting love. We're not obviously solving this, are we? No. It is time for us to quit, but I want you to hear at least verse 11 before we do. God now speaking. And this is still, it's not so much a picture of a woman now. It is still she, because cities are she, in Hebrew. O oh, afflicted, storm-tossed one, not comforted. I am about to set your stones in antimony, your foundations with sapphires, your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of jewels, and all your, will, your wall of precious stone. Your time of desolation is done. I'm going to build this city so beautifully, so jewel-encrusted. Uh, you will be a glory in all the earth. This is restoration. Let's pray. Lord, we don't understand very well. Thank you that you own up to the times that we feel abandoned. Thank you, Lord, for actually stepping away from us in the times when that's when we need tough love. Thank you for loving us enough to do the hardest things. And thank you, Lord, for your steadfast, eternal love that comes rushing right back in to hold us in promise. Lord, let your, let your hard work do what it needs to do in us. And then restore us in your love forever. As you do in your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray.